Welcome to Lecture 19. Sitting outside on a beautiful spring morning. You can probably hear the traffic in the background and the birds singing. So it's a wonderful day to do a little bit more redox and then talk about acids and bases. We're going to do two problems from the previous lecture just to um, give you some more practice with me and then you'll have practice of course in your recitation and on sapling. So the first thing we're going to do is assign oxidation numbers in number one here to all atoms for the following. Now we I see some polyatomic ions here um, that can help. You can think of it, you can certainly isolate out the polyatomic ions. I'm talking about permanganate right here and um, oxalate here. But we don't have to do that. We see lots of oxygens in every example and we know what the oxidation number for oxygen is so start there. We have minus two here for oxygen. I have four of them. And the potassium there in the front is always going to be plus one in a compound. Your group one and group two metals um, and your group three metals are always going to be what you would expect. So this has to add up to zero. There's no charge on this ionic compound. So we've got negative eight and a positive one. And so what does manganese need to be for this to add up to zero? plus seven. Manganese is a metal that changes its oxidation number quite a bit. All right, nickel. I'll leave you to come up with the name for that. It needs a Roman numeral. And it will be the same as the oxidation number the Roman numeral will be once we've assigned it. So negative two again for oxygen times two. So I've got a negative four here. This has to add up to zero. So nickel is plus four, and the name of this compound would be nickel, Roman numeral four, oxide. All right, sodium oxalate. We know oxygen is negative two, and we know sodium is plus one, and I have two of those. All right, so let's set up maybe a little over here. So I've got plus two, plus x, plus a negative eight, so really it's a minus eight. Oops. Okay, minus eight, and that has to equal zero. There's no charge here. So what is x? X looks like to me it's um, combine these two together, you have negative six, so x must be positive six. But I've got two carbons in this compound right here, okay? So the two of them together are positive six. So each carbon is plus three. Okay, so one more time. Plus two for the sodiums. Negative eight for the oxygens. This is the carbon. All the oxidation numbers have to add up to zero. So X has to be plus six, but I've got two carbons, so that makes each carbon plus three. Remember I told you in the last lecture that we talk about oxidation number per atom, right? So negative two for oxygen, per oxygen, times six is a negative 12. Now I have to have this add up to zero, so a negative six, I mean, I'm sorry, a negative 12 and a plus 12 will add up to zero. So those four phosphorus atoms are a total of plus 12. Well, four divided by 12 is three, so each phosphorus is plus three. All right, those were some good examples, a little harder than the ones we tackled in the previous lecture. Now I have picked this following example for the reason it looks complicated, I know, but I have some ionic, uh, I can split some of this up. And many of these substances, the sodium for example, I see sodium in a compound here, I see sodium in a compound here, and I see sodium in a compound here. Sodium is always plus one. Sodium isn't changing here. All right. But I'm going to break up my aqueous things, including this strong acid, nitric acid. We're going to talk about acids today. So I'm going to break up my aqueous things, okay, because I want to focus on the things that are changing. And that will make it easier when I go to do my half reactions. Leave the, X, the solid together. Break up that strong acid. Leave the polyatomic ion nitrate alone. Okay. 
goes to, need to save some room here, um, Na plus plus 3I minus, crazy, plus xenon, the element, plus water, plus the sodium nitrate. Now, <clears throat> not only is nothing happening to sodium, but nothing's happening to nitrate either. They are spectators. So what is changing here? I see iodine right here as a monatomic ion. That means its oxidation number is minus one. Over here, I have um, I am going to change this breaking up over here because I know what the oxidation number is for the iodine here. It is going to be, I'm going to leave it as I3 with a minus one charge. So because of the plus one and the minus one. The oxidation number on iodine here, each one is minus one third. And this happens. Don't freak out. It's okay. We'll take care of it. Xenon is my other one that's changing. Nothing's happening to hydrogen, plus one, uh, plus one over here in water. So oxygen's minus two, and I have three of them. So what does that make xenon? Okay, that would make xenon a positive six. All right, so let's look at those oxidation numbers. What is changing? Oh, xenon is zero. Over here is the element. So I have focused in on the things I know that are changing. I see hydrogen in compounds, I see the sodium in compounds, I see nitrate on one, this side and I see nitrate on the other side. Nothing's happening to nitrogen, nothing is happening to oxygen. It is iodine and xenon. Iodine is going from a minus one to a minus one third. So it is getting more positive, whereas xenon is going from a plus six to zero, so my reduction is the xenon. So xenon tetra uh, trioxide, I'm going to leave myself a lot of space, goes to xenon the element. All right, let's focus on this half reaction. Um, xenon, I've balanced that part, so I'm ready to add electrons based on the change in the oxidation number. So plus six to zero means I have gained six electrons. Okay, next, balance charge nice that you have the H plus right there in the equation so you know you can use it to balance charge and I'm going to be adding it on this side because this side has a charge of zero. No charges over here. This side right now has a negative six. So I need six H pluses so that when I add the negative six and the plus six I end up with a net charge of zero. Now I need to balance the oxygens. I've got three oxygens on the left I'm going to put three waters on the right to balance the oxygens. And if the hydrogens work, I've done everything correctly. And indeed, they do. Six hydrogens, six hydrogens. So that is my oxidation, my reduction, half reaction. Now, let's do, I'm going to give myself a little more room. I'll get it back. Don't worry. Okay. And scroll. I don't want to scroll because then I won't get it back. All right. So oxidation. I minus goes to I three negative. I will not give you one this complicated, but it's a good one because I could break things up into their ionic form to simplify writing the half reactions. And that's why we do it. I don't want the sodium in my half reaction. I don't want the nitrate in there and so on. Okay. All right. I've got an unbalance of the iodines here. So I'm going to put a three in front of the iodine on the left. Now I've got a total of negative three going to a negative one. So that whole negative one third thing is going to be taken care of here. And I am only adding or losing one electron because I'm going for, well, hold on. Negative one to negative one third I'm sorry, that's not right. That's a change of minus two-thirds times three, two electrons. 
okay? All right, so once again, we have a minus two-thirds change per iodine. And we have uh, three of them. So three times two is six. So that's equal to six divided by three. So that is two electrons. I know this is a little bit more complicated. All right, let's continue on. On this side, on the right-hand side, I have a total of minus three. I've got a negative one here. And then those two negative electrons gives me a charge of minus three. I also have a minus three charge on the uh, left, three times the minus one. So actually, this uh, half reaction is finished. Charge is balanced, and uh, I've added my electrons. Nothing else needs to be added. So this is a good example also because you see that I'm just making both sides the same. They don't have to be zero. It all, often happens that they are. Now, the last thing we need to do before we're finished is look at those numbers of electrons. Two here in the oxidation, six in the reduction. I'm going to have to multiply that oxidation times three to get that to work out. So if you don't mind, I'm going to erase this oxidation half reaction and then rewrite it underneath the reduction. So we're going to end up with nine I minuses, three I threes, and six electrons. Rid of some of this stuff. Okay, now back. Boop. All right, so oxidation. Nine I three minuses goes to three I three negatives plus six electrons. All right. So when I add these two half reactions together, the electrons cancel, and that's all that cancels, bringing down everything X. X, uh, Z9 trioxide, 9I3 negative, nope, 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 sorry, messed that up, no 3 here, Nine i minus, all right, so that's taken care of, that's taken care of, plus 6H plus goes to Z9 plus 3I3 negative, plus three waters. Now, if you don't want to go any farther, just fast forward to where I talk about acids and bases. I am going to recombine this uh, balanced equation with what I had to begin with. Okay? So I'm going to take that uh, XeO3, doesn't change. The 9I minus, the I minus was originally with sodium iodide up here. So it's going to be nine NAIs plus the H plus came from the nitric acid, so six HNO3s, arrow, xenon, plus three NAI3s plus three waters. And then I have the uh, sodium nitrate, and that's there to balance out my sodiums and my nitrates. I have, let's see, three sodiums on the right. I have nine sodiums on the left. So I need six more sodiums. So six NaNO3s, and the nitrates should be balanced. Six nitrates here on the right, six nitrates over here on the left, and everything should be balanced. It looks good to me. Six hydrogens, over here on the left, uh, three times two, six hydrogens over here on the right, and there you go. All right, let's move on to today's lecture, which is about acids and bases. A lot of definitions, some vocabulary, all right, so for those of you who are more comfortable with that, um, not much math yet. All right, so scrolling. All right, we're going to talk about acids and bases, and then we're going to review our acid-base reactions that we talked about before because they're double replacement. So essentially, we're leaving redox behind. You won't see redox until 132. I had a student. I was thinking about not going through the whole method, but I had one of my students from Chem 100 tell me, yes, please do, because it really does prepare you, okay, for things that you're going to be doing later. All right, acids. You're familiar with acids, lemon juice, and 
um, oranges and things that are sour, okay, are acidic. So that is one property of acids. So we're going to talk about properties first. There's my little thing. Um, so oranges and lemons, sour milk. Uh, acids and bases will both change the color of pH indicators, either on paper or in solution. Maybe in um, high school you did a purple cabbage lab. I think you'll actually do it again here at South when you do 131 lab. So purple cabbage is full of different acid base indica indicators. Excuse me. Like you can get about 14 different colors out of uh, purple cabbage juice. Because bases share this property, I won't repeat it again when I talk about the bases. Some acids react with active metals. So you know not to put certain metals, maybe, you know, in acid. Uh, maybe some of you have tried making something unsafe by doing that. We won't go into it. Um, we're going to talk about the activity series today. And the only, metal, whoa, the only metals that will react with acids readily are those that are above the activity series, above hydrogen on the activity series. So what metals are doing when they react with acids? So let's just do one here. Um, so if I take a little piece of magnesium and I put it in a hydrochloric acid, it reacts quite readily. The reason why is because magnesium is wants to be, now that we have more vocabulary under our belt, magnesium wants to be oxidized more than hydrogen does. And that is why it is above it on the activity series. I am not doing well with the tablet today. So this is a single replacement reaction. Hydrogen goes home alone and magnesium hangs out with hydrogen's date. Go back to charges, plus two for magnesium, minus one for chlorine. So you put a two there, all right, and balance and so on. So we'll talk about that. We have already talked about acids and bases reacting with each other to produce salts and water. All right, and we are going to talk about that whole strong versus weak again, and it's going to mean more this time, okay? So we are going to talk about acids ionizing, okay? in water to conduct electricity and therefore they are electrolytes. That word implies electricity as we've talked about before are strong acids and bases are strong electrolytes meaning that every single molecule or formula unit in the case of the bases either ionizes or dissociates. You need to know your strong acids and bases and I believe I have listed them again here in the notes. Bases you're not as familiar with. Ammonia, cleaning solution, ammonia is a base. Soap has a bitter taste because it has, um, while the soap that you actually buy at the store is not um, particularly basic, they've neutralized it. Um, you can make soap, and if you have ever used soap that somebody has handmade in a, you know, in a kettle outside, it's pretty, uh, pretty caustic. That's another word for a base. The uh, chemical industry uses that word for base. Um, they feel slippery to the touch, and the reason why is because it's actually dissolving uh, skin cells, taking those dead skin cells off, and uh, can be just as dangerous as strong acids. They just don't uh, make the Hollywood movies like strong acids do. Let me just say here that some of the things you might have seen in movies about acids eating holes in decks of ships and that sort of thing and dissolving. Um, if any of you watch Breaking Bad where they dissolve a corpse in hydrofluoric acid, no, I'll notice here that in our list of strong acids, the um, Binary acids from the halogens, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, and hydroiodic are strong, but HF is not. And the, the reality of a high school chemistry teacher having jugs of hydrofluoric acid on the shelf, not very realistic. I like watching that series so I can pick, pick away at the chemistry. Anyway, um, not sure about whether or not hydrofluoric acid can dissolve a corpse. All right, moving on. Here are your strong acids and strong bases again. Memorize them. Memorize them. It's not that much. The bases are easy. It's just the hydroxides 
from group 1A and group 1B. Okay, from your uh, periodic table. And two, 2A, I'm sorry, 1A and 2A. The soluble uh, hydroxides. Your strong acids, um, there, there's like, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Just memorize the seven. Everything else is weak. There are lots of acids and bases. The majority of them are weak. So that means they're weak electrolytes and not strong electrolytes. And we're going to revisit that idea again as well. All right. Now, this is the thing that's a little difficult about uh, acids and bases. There are three different definition systems for defining whether a substance is an acid or a base. Each system has its advantages and disadvantages. Different types of scientists use uh, the different types. The Arrhenius system is the one we're going to talk about first, and it is the one that is favored, of course, by biologists. biologists. Uh, because we live in a water-based world and we are water-based organisms, this definition works fine. It is confined to aqueous solutions, and the definition of an acid, and I've actually color-coded some of my stuff here, increases the concentration of H plus in aqueous solution. All right? Now, let me talk about H plus. This species here really does not exist. If you're in an aqueous solution, which most of the time you are, if you're talking about H plus, but not always, then the H plus actually hooks onto a water molecule, all right? And you produce what is called the hydronium ion. So in reality, whenever we say H plus, what we really mean is hydronium. So this is a polyatomic ion that if you go back to that website that I had referenced before on polyatomic ions, this is the other positive polyatomic ion in addition to ammonium. Okay. Now the reason I um, color-coded things dealing with acids as red is because most a lot of pH indicators change to the color of red or in that range of color in the presence of acid. By contrast, the, a lot of pH indicators are blue and purple and that call those green, those colors uh, in the presence of bases. So, in water, acids increase this, okay? And we're going to talk about how they do that. In bases, increase OH minus, all right? Now, revisiting strong versus weak. I'm going to scroll. Now, why is an acid an acid? And I go through that right here. The reason that an acid is an acid is because hydrogen is bonded to some highly electronegative element like chlorine or fluorine, or in the case of the oxy acids, nitric and sulfuric and so on. Hydrogen is not bound to the central atom. It is bonded to one of the oxygens, bonded to the oxygens. Oxygen has a pretty high electronegativity, so in the polar bond, in fact, it's a, we call it a hydrogen bond, Oxygen is pulling the electrons away from hydrogen. And so this bond is, you know, kind of positive over here near hydrogen. A water molecule comes along. Okay, here's my little water molecule. The negative end of the water molecule is strong enough or forms a strong enough attraction between this hydrogen, which is kind of being left out in the cold electron-wise, that it pulls the hydrogen off or some other negatively charged um, species can do this. So the reason that uh, acids are acids and, they, and you produce H pluses, which then, of course, combine with a water molecule to form hydronium, is because of the polar bond between, uh, between an electronegative, highly electronegative uh, element and hydrogen. All right, so the strong acids, every single HCl molecule loses an H plus to a water molecule, as I've just shown here, to produce hydronium, okay? Weak ones don't. You every, every single one does not. I'm going to scroll down and show you a picture we've seen before. And I want to keep that little, def that little uh, equation in view. So here's our strong, like HCl. Every single HCl is dissociated into H plus and Cl minus. So that's why it gets a forward arrow only. Now you know that this is really hydronium. 
okay? Now, a weak acid, on the other hand, like the one that's pictured below this one, and I'll scroll back up in a sec, only a few of the molecules actually ionize. So what's going on here in these weak acids, and we call this an equilibrium system, and this is what happens. A few HFs do produce the uh, product, but what's happening in the reverse direction, what's happening is the reverse direction is happening, and in fact, it's the reverse direction that is the more predominant direction here. Now, when you get to 132, we'll, you will quantify that. So you have very, much smaller amounts of H3O+, plus, enough to, you know, do some damage, depending on how uh, weak or there are definitely, def you know, you can quantitatively assign strength to these. You'll do that in 132. But this equilibrium system implies a forward and a reverse reaction. For many of the weak acids, it's the reverse that is the dominating. You only produce very few, and then some of those products recombine to produce reactants again. All right. Now, so that's your um, strong versus weak Arrhenius um, and acids. Strong versus weak Arrhenius bases, you are increasing OH minus in water. The OH minus comes from the base itself, and it's a complete. Every single KOH formula unit, because it's ionic, produces a K plus and an OH minus. Now, and there's no water because it's, 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 it's aqueous. And we've encountered this question before. I could put water in, and I'd put water on this side, and I would put water on this side, and they would essentially cancel out. Now, what happens with weak bases is quite different. Ammonia, most common weak base that you will see in textbooks. There's no OH here. So where is the OH coming from? Well, the OH is actually coming from the water molecule. Because what's happening here is nitrogen, pretty electronegative, has a lone pair, actually pulls a hydrogen off of the water molecule so that you are left with an OH after a hydrogen comes off. And so the OH actually comes from water. Now, this is an equilibrium system because it's weak. So some of these ammonium ions and these hydroxide ions are recombining to form uh, the ammonia and the water again. All right. So I know it's confusing, and I go into that down here in this next paragraph, why we put water in for weak, but we don't put it in for strong. Just know that strong bases are your hydroxides from groups one and two, and so the hydroxide comes from the base itself. Weak Arrhenius bases actually produce OH minus in water, and that's why it's Arrhenius, because you're doing it in water, actually produce the hydroxide from the water molecule. All right, now this gives us a segue into talking about our next definition system. Chemists call this species a proton. And the reason we call it a proton is because the vast majority of the, um, the most common isotope of hydrogen, hydrogen with a mass number of one. Now remember what mass numbers are. They are the number of protons and neutrons. So if the mass number is 1, and the molar mass of hydrogen is close to 1, 1 1.0079, so that means that the majority of the hydrogen ice, uh, atoms out there are this isotope, which is 1 neutron, I'm sorry, 1 proton, because that's what makes it hydrogen, but no neutrons. Okay, So that's why the mass number is 1. So if you take an electron away from hydrogen, which is why it has the plus charge, what you have left is essentially a naked proton. So we call those protons. Now, what is happening here in this example that we just talked about with ammonia is it's taking an H plus, a proton, off of the water to produce the OH minus in water. Our next definition system focuses on the protons, okay? Acids produce protons, so it's in red for acid, produce protons. So what's the acid here? Who's producing or losing a proton? It's the water molecule. 
who is gaining the proton, the base, ammonia. So this one is probably the most common definition outside of biology because it's not necessarily um, dependent on you, you having water around. So you can have protons going back and forth between acids and bases. All right, so acids donate H pluses and bases accept them. So let's identify, so here's an, here is an acid-base reaction. And in fact, if you take a bottle of strong hydrochloric acid and put it next to a bottle of strong of, of ammonia, which is not strong base, but still, so you take a bottle of HCl and open it up, and H actually hydrochlo hydrogen chloride is a gas, so the hydrogen chloride gas comes out. Hydrochloric acid is just the gas dissolved in water. Ammonia is the same thing. Ammonia is a gas, and it's dissolved in water. So you open it up, and the ammonia comes out. Well, if you put them close enough together, you can actually see white smoke in between the bottles. And what you're seeing, because you see this white smoke, it means it's heterogeneous, because this ammonium chloride is in the air as, as a solid that's an ionic compound. So no water involved here at all. So who's losing the proton? The HCl takes the proton and gives it to the ammonia. This is the acid and this is the base. All right, so this is an acid-base reaction. <clears throat> so it's a little more universal. Now, we saw in some reactions um, up above that water itself can be a proton donor when combined with a base, and it can be a proton acceptor when combined with an acid. So let me scroll back up and show you what I'm talking about. Water goes both ways. It is both an acid and a base. All right, so in this example right here, water is losing a proton to the base. So this is the base, and this is the acid, all right? Scrolling back up to um, an acid in water example, right here, either one, HF is losing the H. So as you go from this side to this side, what happened? This is how you need to look at these. What's going on? What's the action? The action is HF loses a hydrogen. So that makes it an acid in the Bronsted-Lowry sense. And water is gaining the proton, so it makes it a base in the bronsted lowry sense. So it's gaining a proton to produce the hydronium ion. Same thing is true up here. So water can be both an acid and a base if it's combined with a stronger version of either the acid or the base. All right. Now, the reason I have left room here is because I want to talk about polyprotic acids. So I mention it here in these couple of sentences that some acids have more than one proton. So poly means more than one protic. So sulfuric acid is an, an example of that. Often what happens is, well, most of the time, always really, when you have more than one hydrogen to lose, you lose them one at a time, okay? So when sulfuric acid loses the first hydrogen, you are left with a negative charge. So anytime something loses an H+, plus, what it leaves behind has to have a negative charge. Plus H+, plus, or if you put water in, then we can make it hydronium. Okay? So let me write that in. Water. All right? So losing a proton to water, so water is actually acting as a base here. Okay? Now, you take this species and you lose the second one. Now, this second step is actually a weak step, so it's an equilibrium system. So when I lose another H+, I am left with the sulfate ion and hydronium. If I put water on this side. So polyprotic acids lose the hydrogens one at a time. 
Sulfuric acid is a strong acid, but it's only strong for losing the first uh, hydrogen. So we would call this the first ionization, and we would call this the second. And this can be quantified, and you will do that in 132. All right, some bases are also poly in that they have two hydroxides to dissociate. Now, this will come in uh, later when we talk about pH. So if I have calcium hydroxide, when it is dissolved in water, I get a calcium ion and two hydroxides. All right, now we've encountered this idea of stoichiometry when things dissolve before. Um, and so I wanted to remind you of that here. Uh, and I do mention here that uh, there was an older, you know, when I was in school I learned it, but we really did, it's not even in the textbooks anymore, and there was an older concentration unit in addition to molarity called normality. And it was that high sulfuric acid, this, you know, this H2SO4 has two equivalents of acid, and calcium hydroxide has two equivalents of base. So it's just an older definition system, and I was just going to throw it in just in case you ever saw it again. All right, last definition, and this is the one favored by organic chemists. Much of organic chemistry has to do with Lewis acids and bases. No water needed at all. In fact, you don't even need a hydrogen. So it's much more um, broad in the sense of, as, of a de as a definition. And G and Lewis, one who came up with it, same guy as Lewis dot structures. So your Lewis acids, so here we are in red, a Lewis acid accepts a pair of electrons and a Lewis base donates a pair of electrons. Now, we have already seen a Lewis acid base. In fact, we see it every time water molecule accepts a hydrogen to form the hydronium ion. Okay, so let me show you what I'm talking about. And I will give us a little room right here. Okay, so when water, so when I take a H plus and I put it onto a water molecule to produce the hydronium ion, H plus is a proton, remember? No electron here. So this is an electron poor species. It's the, uh, the organic chemist would call it an electrophile. All right has no electrons. Water has an atom, oxygen, which has lone pairs. And it's pairs of electrons here that make a Lewis acid or a base. It has to do with pairs of electrons. So what happens to form the hydronium ion is, let's draw our Lewis structure of water. So there's H2O. And then here are the two lone pairs. So what happens when you do this Lewis acid and you form a new bond, and organic chemists push electrons. Um, they're showing where this pair of electrons goes. This pair of electrons, here's H plus. Whoop. Here's H plus out here in the wings. Sorry about that. Why it's doing that? I know why. So here's H plus out here in the wings. And so this pair of electrons goes to form a bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen to form H3O plus. So it is a molecule of water with an extra bond to oxygen, hydrogen rather, and of course it has a positive charge. So a pair of electrons was donated by the oxygen which makes it the Lewis base. It is electron rich and the organic chemists call those nucleophiles while the H plus is electron poor and accepts that pair of electrons into its empty orbital and you call you you are actually forming a type of bond called a coordinate covalent bond and over across the pond in Europe many scientists over there call it a dative bond. All right so three definitions you might want to go through that part of the lecture two or three times I remember as a student uh, they, that being difficult okay to, to grasp. All right naming acids and bases we have already talked about that so I'm going to leave that to you to review.
Okay, so make sure you review naming. All right, ready for a little bit more vocab. All right, strong, strong acid. This is important. So when I have a strong acid and I have an arrow that says every single reactant becomes a product, this um, which makes it a strong acid, this means that this is not happening. So strong acids often, well, strong acids produce weak, what we call conjugates. All right, now, a weak conjugate base. Water here is acting as a base because it's accepting the proton from HCl also. HCl is increasing the H3O plus, so this is, um, all three definition systems here really apply. This is Arrhenius because it increases the H3O plus concentration in water. It is Bronsted-Lowry because we've got protons being donated and accepted. And it's also Lewis, as we just went through, when an H plus is accepted by water. So this reaction here goes uh, all three definition systems. Now, to make this easier to understand, I really need to talk about the weak. Okay, so let me scroll down a little bit because what I just wrote is right here in the notes. So this is an acid and this is a base. The partner or the species that water becomes, and remember I said focus on the action, is on the other side. So these are a pair and these guys are a pair. Okay, what happened to the HCl is it became Cl minus. Well, because there's no backwards reaction, the conjugate of HCl is weak, meaning that it's not going to go in the reverse direction. Water as a base produces a conjugate acid of H3O plus. All right, it's pretty weak base, water, actually, and so its conjugate is actually a little bit stronger, which is the opposite of um, the HCl and its conjugate. Now, let's go down here to a weak example where I do have a reverse direction. HF, weak acid, combines with water, a weak base. And what I produce on the other side, because they're weak and I have this reverse direction is, these guys actually must be strong because this direction predominates. So weak form stronger partners or conjugates, strong form weaker conjugates. And what that means is, is that these guys down here in particular have acid-base properties themselves. Otherwise, it wouldn't be going in the reverse direction because what happens in the reverse direction? What happens to F minus? It takes a proton back. So it is a base. And H3O plus loses a proton, so it makes it an acid. Up here, the reverse direction doesn't even happen. So these conjugates are significantly weaker because it came from a strong. And the same idea holds for bases as well. Weak bases form stronger conjugate acids. So this got a little out. Let me fix that. Okay. So uh, because I have a backwards direction, the ammonium ion itself is a pretty good acid. It's stronger than the base it came from. OH minus is a pretty strong conjugate base and is stronger than the acid that it came from. All right, I think we're ready for some practice. And I think, I believe that's going to uh, finish us off for today. All right, let's see, let's scroll down a little bit. Nope, we're gonna talk about acid-base reactions a little bit. I lied, we have some more, okay. Let's, um, let's just do a little practice right here, identifying acids or bases, and write a chemical equation showing it as an acid or base according to the Arrhenius definition. To the Arrhenius definition, which means you are going to be putting it in water. Okay, all right. So I'll do um, first one, strong acid, H2SO4. And we've already done those two equations earlier, but I'm gonna lose the two protons together that's okay. So I will need two water molecules and I will produce two hydronium ions because I lost both H pluses and the sulfate ion. 
right? So I've increased the amount of hydronium in water. That's why it's Arrhenius. Strontium hydroxide, strong base. All I have to do is dissolve it in water, and I produce the hydroxide, two of them, in fact, from the base itself. Remember, strong bases produce the hydroxide themselves. C, HBr, I'm going to do it up above here, HBr in water, the hydrogen, this is a strong acid, is donated to the water molecule and you are left with bromine. So strong acid, weak conjugate base, okay? So everything here, A, B, and C is strong and sodium hydroxide, our last one, a strong base, is also um, strong. So sodium hydroxide dissolved in water produces lots more OH minuses. All right. For each reaction in number two, identify the Bronsted-Lowry acid, the base, the conjugate, and the conjugates. Okay, so let's give ourselves a little more room here. Alright, A, we just wrote this one. So who is losing a proton? If we're talking about Bronsted Lowry, we're losing protons. That makes HBr the acid. Water is accepting the proton, which makes it the base. So look what happens to HBr as it goes across. It loses a proton. Look what happens to the water as it goes to the other side. It's gaining a proton. So that makes Br minus. If this was an acid, then this is a conjugate base and this is a conjugate acid. All right? What happens to NH3 as it goes to the other side? It's gaining a hydrogen. That makes it a base. What's happening to water as it goes to the other side? It's losing a proton. That makes it an acid. So this is a conjugate acid, and because this is weak, how do I know? This is a clue. Plus, I've memorized my strongs. So this is a stronger conjugate acid, and this is a conjugate base because it came from this acid. What's happening to HNO3 as it goes to the other side? It's losing a proton. That makes it an acid. Water is gaining a proton as it goes to the other side. Focus on the action. That makes it a base. This is strong because I've memorized that nitric is strong. This arrow is another clue. That makes this a conjugate acid because it came from a base. And the nitrate is a very weak conjugate base. So all of your um, conjugate bases that come from strong acids, sulfate, nitrate, chloride, bromide, and so on, um, often are spectator ions because they don't really have a lot of chemistry themselves. All right, this little species here that you don't know how to name it, that's okay. What happens to it as it goes to the other side? It's gaining a proton and it's a base. The presence of this is very predominant in bases, in your weak bases. What's happening to water? It is losing a proton, which makes it the acid. This is weak because this is not one of the strong bases, plus the double-sided arrow is another clue. So this is the conjugate acid, and this is the conjugate base. All right, next, scrolling. So we're going to write the formula for the conjugate base of each of these acids. So each of these acids is going to take the hydrogen off. That's what acids do. And remember, if you take a hydrogen off, an H plus off, you're left with something with a negative charge. So Br minus is our, my conjugate base for A. ClO4 minus is my conjugate acid base for B. 
taking one hydrogen off on C, because this is polyprotic, I am left with a hydrogen carbonate ion. Taking two off, I'm left with a carbonate ion. And in D, this is acetic acid, and when I take the hydrogen off, I am left with acetate. And now, conversely, we are going to write the formulas for the conjugate acids of each of these bases. I need to create some room here, so I am going to scroll, giving you some warning. Okay. I mean, I have to do this. Hold on. I might be able to get, bring it back. I can, I know. As long as I don't scroll where I change the position of what I've written. All right, so... Um, Bases gain protons. What are they gaining? They're gaining something with a positive charge. So CH3, NH3 plus. So it's going to have a positive charge. C5, H5, NH plus. Now, I know what you're thinking. How do I know where to put this hydrogen? It's generally put on the right next to, um, if you're talking about bases, then that the bond is being formed between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. This is Bronsted, Lowry, and Lewis because you got the naked proton with the empty orbital. Nitrogen has the lone pair, and you form that bond. Okay? Conjugate acid of each base, so gaining an H plus in combination with the negative, no charge. Same thing in D, H plus in combination with the uh, negative charge. All right? Okay, in review, to finish us up, acid-base reactions, and then we're going to talk about um, the single replacement reactions, which I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, and that will finish us off. All right, so we've already talked about acid-base reactions, um, and, we call, and I've all, already talked about the fact that we call them neutralization reactions, which is not a very good choice of words, all right? So we know that we produce water because the positive from this and the negative from this make water. What's left is called a salt, right? And we can end up with a net ionic equation that's very common for um, acid-base reactions. We, if we don't write H+, and we write hydronium, so instead of writing this to produce one water molecule, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, this really doesn't exist, so we're going to write it as hydronium plus an OH, and now you produce two waters to balance. You, we've already talked about when an H plus combines with carbonate and you produce as a product on the other side H2CO3, that that falls apart to carbon dioxide and water. So that's a, uh, an exception to acid-base um, net ionic equations. This is the most common right here. But if you've got a carbonate involved, you're going to get the carbon dioxide and water. All right. Now, metals reacting with acids and some metal oxides. So we're now we're going to talk about single displacement reactions, which are redox reactions. Okay. And so what we have to do in order to understand this is look at this activity series. And what it really means is, is who wants to be oxidized and who wants to be reduced. Well, your most reactive elements, your group 1 and group 2s, are at the top of this activity series. So lithium, potassium, strontium, calcium, and so on. There's hydrogen in the activity series. And below hydrogen in the activity series are some of the metals that you are familiar with as things being made out of, like copper and silver and platinum and gold. The reason that these metals are so valued is, one, their rarity, as you know, we don't have a whole lot of them, um, and the fact that they are not reactive. So that's why they're at the bottom of the activity series. They want to stay reduced. They do oxidize. You know that copper oxidizes. It doesn't stay shiny and pretty. That's the reason why. Same thing with silver. But as you get down here to platinum and gold, which are more valuable, they want to stay in the element, you know, state, the, the reduced state, and not become Au+. Plus. That's losing um, an electron, which is oxidation. So the stuff at the top of the activity series really wants to be oxidized. And this is the way it works. When you do a single replacement reaction, and let's just talk about something simple like A plus BC, a replaces B, B has to go home alone, 
and C and A are now hanging out. Okay. Well, in order for this to happen, A must be above B on the activity series. If we do this combination, we will get no reaction if indeed this is the placement on the activity series. So the element, that, the one that comes alone, must be above the other one in the compound in order for it to replace it. Okay? So many of these uh, metals replace hydrogen in an acid. So if I take zinc and put it in hydrochloric acid, zinc will replace hydrogen to produce H2, the element, and zinc and chlorine hang out. Go back to charges, plus two for zinc from the periodic table, minus one for chlorine, so Z and Cl2. All right? So that's how you would write a metal reacting with an acid according to the activity series. There's one more thing I need to tell you, and that is some metals, metal oxides, react, I'm sorry, some yeah, metal oxides like potassium oxide react with acids in a double displacement reaction. So hydrogen and oxygen form water, and potassium and chlorine form a salt. Okay, I think there's one um, recitation question on that. The one that's most common though is taking a metal that's above hydrogen on the activity series and replacing hydrogen. Taking a metal that's above hydrogen on the activity series and in fact this is such a reactive metal sodium that it'll even replace hydrogen in water. Water can be an acid remember and uh, zinc not too many things made out of pure zinc because if you get the water hot enough you can also replace hydrogen um, out of water with the zinc. All right And one last thing, and that is titrations. Titration is really a vocab word. It's also a lab, but it is nothing more than an acid-base reaction. In lab, you'll do this in 131. And what happens is, generally, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a concentration of something. So you put in this piece of equipment called a burette. You put what you know. You put the one you know. And in the bottom, you put the one you don't know, and you titrate until moles of acid equals moles of base. Usually what you do is you pick some acid base indicator that changes color when this happens. Okay, But it's really no different in terms of writing the equation. It's a base plus an acid and a double replacement reaction. Sodium chloride is the salt plus water. All right, so and your book, sapling, and so on will talk about titrations and what they're talking about is a double replacement acid-base reaction. They're just using the term for the lab. All right, so don't let that scare you. Let's do a few practice here, and then we're going to draw this long lecture. I know it's long to a close. All right. Four examples. Write a neutralization reaction for each acid base pair. So I have double replacement. So I've got one hydrogen here, two hydroxides. I know I'm going to produce two waters. And my salt is the strontium in combination with the perchlorate. Strontium has a plus two. Perchlorate has a minus one. So I need two of those minus ones to cancel out. And a two in front here. All right, two waters again because of the two hydroxides plus barium and nitrate back to charges. Barium is plus two, nitrate's minus one, so I need two of those negative ones and I need two nitrates, hydrogen nitrates. All right, these three reactive metals in number two react with um, acids because they are above. Now I'm going to go, uh, so hydrogen is produced, plus we can go with rubidium bromide. However, rubidium especially is in the same column with sodium, so let's go up and just scroll real quick 
write this down if you need to. I don't know if I'll be able to bring it back. So if we go back to the reaction of sodium in water, not only does sodium take uh, produce hydrogen here, oops, sorry, okay, but sodium actually, there's a hydroxide. See, some metals just react with, you know, just combine with the oxygen. Other metals actually produce a hydroxide. We're going to do that with the rubidium because it's in the same column as sodium, okay? So what happens here is, okay, so rubidium combines with the acid and you produce hydrogen. Of course, you're replacing hydrogen the element and then rubidium combines with what's left over from the um, acid. Well, that was, no, I'm going to go back, sorry. We're going to go with rubidium bromide. That is easier for you. We were putting sodium in water before. We're putting this in acid, so let's just go with that. Okay, easier. Plus one, minus one. Um, balancing, I need two of these, so I will need two of these and two of these. All right? Magnesium plus HBr. Hydrogen is replaced, and you have magnesium bromide. Go back to charges, and balancing, everything gets a two except the hydrogen. And then same thing with barium. No, I'm going to need two. Produce H2 plus BABR2. Um, wait, 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 all this one up here. Um, B, I don't need this two here. And I don't need the two there because there's the two bromines, two bromines, two hundreds. Okay. All right. All right. Metal oxide and HI in three. This is a double replacement reaction. So MgO plus HI. You produce water because the hydrogen and the oxygen combine to make water. And magnesium is with iodine. Go back to charges, plus two for magnesium, minus one for iodine. All right, balancing, I need two of these. And that should do it. Calcium oxide, plus two HI, I believe I'm gonna need two, because I need two hydrogens to make the water. And then calcium is in the same column with magnesium, plus two for calcium, negative one for iodine, okay? And then sodium oxide plus HI, water, and two NAI, plus one for sodium, minus one for iodine. I knew I was going to need that two there because of the two over here. Remember, subscripts don't carry over. I was going with charges. So two hydrogens, two hydrogens, one oxygen. Okay, we're good. And I'm going to save this last example for, and we're going to do that one at the beginning of the next lecture. Because this has gotten long, I need to get ready to go to campus, and I know I have saturated you today. <laughs>